Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining me. Um, today, I want to do a quick uh, chat on uh, the lectures and sayings of Musonius Rufus. I just finished this uh, recently, and um, yeah, following this chat, I will also do uh, touch briefly on what I'm currently reading, as well as do a drawing to let the randomness of the universe choose my next work uh, to read. Uh, but uh, the lectures and sayings of Musonius Rufus, um, this um, was translated by uh, Cynthia King, and um, she is a professor at... Um, of classics at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. And then this was edited and it has a preface by William B. Irvine, who is a professor of philosophy at the uh, Wright State University in Dayton. And um, I've read um, some another work by William B. Irvine, a Stoic work. It was called uh, the Good, A Guide to the Good Life, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy that I read several years ago. And it's really what kicked off this sort of Stoic exploration that I've been doing ever since. So I have wanted to read this for a long, Long time. Musonius Rufus is um, one of the big four of the Roman Stoic philosophers. Um, we have Seneca, uh, you know, who I've read. Marcus Aurelius, you know, the Meditations, I've read that. Um, then we have Epictetus, whose discourses I am still reading and actually doing, um, you know, book, I'm doing chats on each of the chapters as I go through chapter by chapter. Um, and then Musonius Rufus was actually Epictetus's teacher. So he's been on my radar for a long time to read, and I'm really, I put him on, I put this on my must-read list for this year so that I would certainly get this work, of important work of Stoicism done. Um, I was really interested to learn that there has not been a, a translation of this since uh, of Musonius Rufus since 1947, and the translation back then was done by Cora Lutz. Um, and it it's just interesting to me how um, how that or it's sort of interesting to me first of all how fragmented our knowledge of ancient Stoics are, and then also just sort of the way that. Um, that this information from Musonius Rufus has come down to us to the, for, to the, from the to the current to the present day, um, because um, most of you know the sto lot, so much of the the, um, the material from the ancient world, the Stoic material from the ancient world has been lost. Like there's nothing that survives of the major works of the Greek Stoics, and then only you know really a little bit. Uh, survives from the Roman Stoics, and it was such an important philosophy to the Greeks and also really to the Romans that, you know, it's, that sort of surprises me. But this uh, Lectures and Sayings is, is collected from different sources. For example, Musonius Rufus is talked about by Tacitus, as well as Pliny the Younger. And then most of the these lectures actually were um, come to us through a work from the 4th century called the um, Anthology, and this is this was by Strobius, um, but it was also uh, only uh, preserved in and not complete and not not complete, you know. So um, we also have the work from a work from the ninth century by someone called uh, Photius, who was a ninth century church figure, and he published a book review, a review of books um, called a Bibliotheca. And um, this uh, work from Strobius is mentioned there. So um, it's just sort of fragments that we have been able to receive. And so, um, you know, to the present day, but what they've done here, Cynthia King and the editor, William B. Irvine, is they've collected all that they can find of lectures and sayings of, of uh, lectures and then the sayings um, and, and, and added them, you know, published them in this in this volume. Um, we also have some sayings and things from Epictetus and from um, I think also Seneca might have mentioned him too at some point. I might be wrong about that. But anyway, um, so I just think that's real interesting how, you know, how precarious this knowledge from the ancient world sometimes um sometimes was and so much of it you know ultimately was lost so we're very thankful for what we did wind up getting here in the present day but what this is about um you know whereas um each of the the big four i've found read a read differently seneca's um kind of very intellectual uh, marcus aurelius is sort of um you know um has the meditations, so sort of contemplative, um, and also, but, you know, sort of life instructions, but in sort of short, sort of 
segments, and then Epictetus is conversations, you know, the discourses, and then uh, Musonius and Rufus are really lectures. There are 21 lectures in this uh, book, and then there are a number of sayings, and at the very end, there are a couple of letters that have been attributed to him, which I'll talk about more here in a bit, but just about the lectures, you know, what really struck me was how relevant they are to to life, because Ruf Musonius Rufus is really focusing on instructions for how to live a good life, really specifically to that. And so he talks on all sorts of topics about living, the art of living, um, addressing, you know, various questions. One that really stuck out at me was, you know, should women study philosophy? And the answer was yes, he felt like they should, that women should lead, lead a virtuous life as well as men, and that they require the same, uh, their minds require the same practice that male minds do, and so it, it benefits uh, women to also study philosophy as well as men, and that's something I don't hear a lot of from the ancient world. And then another uh, instance about girls and boys being educated, and he felt like girls and boys should be educated the same because he felt like women um, f fulfilled a social function in, in society that um, also uh, required uh, a good education ever bit as much as uh, it did for boys. So that was sort of, um, you know, interesting because like I said, you don't always hear this from the ancient world. Um, you know, so um, another thing, a recurring theme throughout the lectures were, was this idea of pain um, and pain to, as a thing not to be feared. Um, so I don't want to give the impression that Stoics or that Rufus was saying that pain was a good um, although, you know, it could be argued in that term, but what, what they're talking about is like not really necessarily inflicting pain on yourself like some sort of flagellant, but um, pain as a way to um, give, you know, practice your mind um, to be able to have sharper senses. So, um, you know, all the senses uh, require uh, in the Stoic view, you know, practice to, to be able to keep them sharp. And that um, pain, you know, for example, he gives the example in some of the lectures of like letting yourself get cold in the winter, letting yourself get hot in the summer, that these types of things, you know, that this keeps your body's uh, sensory systems functioning properly um, because it keeps your awareness of what cold is and what he heat is. And so, um, you know, he would argue that hunger is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing. Um, fasting, you know, to, to, to eat in moderation. And then whenever you, you do without um, food, then, you know, the food that you do take is all the more, more delicious, right? And so I think we've all experienced this when you're hungry and everything just just tastes so good, you know, when you haven't had it for a long time, or when you, you know, when you're when you're sitting down to to a meal uh, that you haven't had in a long time, or that when you're very hungry, it just all it don't changes your experience. So living a life of luxury dulls your senses to this type of thing. And one thing that repeats throughout the the. Um, the, these stoic works a lot of times is the art of living and really the joy of living and you know to cultivate the joy of living and so I think that stoics a lot of times get a reputation of being these sort of cold emotionless people um, but really uh, what I think what at heart as what is at heart of a lot of stoic thinking is actually you know joy and how to live a good life is part is is, is largely tied up in being joyful and how to live a joyful life. So, you know, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, he talks about a few other things, like uh, I mentioned excesses. Um, uh, he talks about sex, you know, like controlling sexual appetites, it's, it's, you know, controlling these excesses like uh, gluttony, gourmet food. Um, he does um, feel like um, these types of excesses are types of things that, um, you know, lead a person into... Um, into bad habits or, or habits that are not uh, healthy for for living a good life um, for the reasons that I've that I've mentioned. So you know I thought that was kind of cool too. And then um, another thing, um, another one that another lecture that I thought was kind of funny was um, beards and hair uh, for men. Uh, like I don't have to worry about this because I don't have any hair. But um, he talks about you know okay men you know you could cut your hair if it's long too long and bothering you but you know you really shouldn't cut your beard because it's there for your perfect protection and it's you know a sign of your manliness and you know I don't really get that because first of all a beard I've tried to grow a beard before and it's itchy and I don't like it and I lasted only like three days 
Um, so it's just beards aren't my thing. Um, but, uh, and this whole thing of manliness, I don't really have my manliness tied up in having a beard. So I'm not quite pretty sure I don't agree with, um, with Musonius Rufus on the beard thing, but uh, I thought it was kind of fun to read. So, um, yeah, another one was aging I wanted to bring up. Um, you know, as I'm getting older, um, is you know, how to age well as a Stoic. It's something I've thought about, and he actually has a lecture on that. And basically, it's that, you know, live your life um, cultivating the tools that you're going to need in your old age. You know, when, when you no longer participate as, in society as much, or when, uh, when maybe you become invalided and things like this, um, that you have developed the skills that would see you through in old age as they do through every life stage. So, um, you know, I enjoyed that lecture as well. So, yeah. Um, and then about the letters at the very end, just one that I'll pull out was one called Letter to Pancrat, um, Pancratides, um, and this letter was, um, it, it was describing why um, Rufus thought that um, Pancratides should educate his sons in philosophy, and I enjoyed the letter very much, but kind of the interesting tidbit about the letter was that um, it had never been published in a language outside of Greek or Latin. The language, the letter was originally written in uh, Greek, and then it was published in a, in a publication in 1871 in along with a Latin uh, interpretation, but in this book was the um, the first time that the work actually that that letter had actually been translated into English or any other language outside of Latin, or so claims uh, Cynthia King, the translator. So I thought that was really interesting and, and cool too. About um, you know, I would have thought that um, a lot of works uh, that really all the important ancient works had been translated. But apparently not. Um, they also describe how you know Musonius Rufus has kind of fallen into obscurity in the current time, and uh, I think that's kind of strange since he's one of the big four. So um, you know, I think that's a little odd. But anyway, I'm super glad I read the book, got it read. This is one of those books that it's like the, the meditations um, or the discourses or the letters of Seneca that that can be referred to um, you know periodically um, you know as needed because they do have some important ideas about how to live a good life and the art of living. So. So I'll end the chat uh, with that um, and now just touch base very briefly on what I am currently reading. Let me call it up for you. Um, I started this um, fairly recently, but I'm, I'm several chapters in. I'm reading Born on a Tuesday by L. Nathan John. This is a Nigerian writer. This book was originally published, I think, in Nigeria in 2015. Um, this concerns a young boy. We don't know his age because he doesn't know his age. Um, he's sort of a street boy in uh, Nigeria, northern Nigeria, and um, he runs with a, a, a gang of boys uh, that are basically homeless, and um, they, um, for where I am right now, they are really just uh, trying to earn earn money and, you know, that type of thing, and they get involved, they've gotten involved in some, um, they get paid by political parties for vandalism and things like this, so... So far, it's a pretty good read. Um, kind of intense in places so far already, but pretty good. So um, looking forward to getting that finished. So let's move on to the drawing for my next read. I only have two works left on my must-read uh, 2017 list. So um, I do hope to get both of these read within the next week, and then I can move on to reading some other things in my supplemental uh, reads. So, okay, my next read is going to be Weep, Shudder, Die. A Guide to Loving Opera. Let me get you to the get to the cover uh, of this. Yeah, Weep, Shudder, Die, A Guide to Loving Opera by Robert Levine. Um, this work is going to be a lot of fun. This quote comes from Bellini, Vincenzo Bellini, the opera composer, and the quote is, Through singing, opera must make you weep shutter die. <laughs> this is going to be timely because I'm actually going to see um, my opera season starts this weekend. I will be seeing Aida, Aida uh, tomorrow. So I'll have an opera chat on Aida coming up very soon. And then I'll be getting to Weep, Shut, or Die after I finish Born on a Tuesday. So stay tuned for that. Until next time, take care. Bye.